So having described the diffraction limit and where it comes from, now I'm going to tell you there are techniques that, that beat the diffraction limit. The main techniques that people talk about are called STORM, PALM and STEAD, and this is what they stand for underneath here. Stochastic Optical Reconstruction Microscopy, Photoactivated Localization Microscopy and Stimulated Emission Depletion Microscopy. They're different techniques, but they all share a common idea. And this is the idea. Imagine we have some point source, so an ideal point source, say a, a single fluorescing molecule, and we image this with a microscope. The smallest you could focus the image down to is half a wavelength of whatever light is being emitted, and that's Abbe's diffraction limit. So your ideal point source, which can be arbitrarily small, will get imaged to something which is at best half a wavelength wide. So this is the half wavelength here, and we're measuring to the point where the intensity drops by a factor of two. The revolutionary idea is that the, the blob may be wide, but if I know the light did come from a single point, I can estimate the position of that point very, very well. So in other words, the error in the mean is much less than the error in any given single measurement. So if I take many, many measurements and I build up a distribution, then I can say where the center of this distribution is, and from that I can estimate exactly where my point source is and I can know the position of that point source much better than the diffraction limit. So here's an example in 1D. Here's a noisy, some noisy data and I've fitted a curve to it. So the model I'm fitting is a Gaussian, it has some amplitude A, some position B on the x-axis, and some width W. And I can fit my red line here using Mathematica or some similar tool, and I find parameters A, B, and W, these are their values, and this is the standard error in these values. So you can see that although my distribution here is wide, you know, it's got a width of, um, you know, about plus minus one here, so width of about, I'm uh, oh, sorry, it's got a width of one. Boo! So although my distribution is wide, the width here is about one, the position here, that is B, is known to within much, much better than one. The standard error in the center of this peak is much, much smaller than that width. So the blob has a width of one, but I can find the standard error much better than that. The error in the, 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 the center of this distribution, roughly, for an optical imaging, is going to be lambda on two sine theta, so this is the Abbe diffraction limit, and it's multiplied by one on root n, where n is the number of photons detected. That's basically saying that if you detect more and more photons and you build up a better and better idea of exactly uh, what the shape of this curve is, then you can localize the center of this curve increasingly well. So here's an example of, of exactly how this might work. So in this image here, you can't really tell whether I've got one single fluorescing molecule or two. They're, they're very close together. It looks like it's a, you know, this blob might be elongated a little bit in this direction, but it's a bit hard to tell. But if I can convince my two sources to emit separately, then I can see two distinct blobs like this. And now I can localize the individual fluorescing atoms or molecules. I can see I have one here and one here. So it's easy to find the center of both sources, each of these individual sources, when they emit separately. If they emit together, it's no good. I can't tell exactly where they are, but if they emit separately, and I know that each of them is a, is a perfect point source, then I can fit some distribution to this and find the center, I can localize the center really, really well. Of course, this is going to depend on some pretty hefty computation. You have to do a lot of fitting to figure out exactly where the center of all your emitters is. Anyhow, the basis, this idea that, that led to these developments of Storm, storm Palm and Stead, um, led to the Nobel Prize for Chemistry being given to these techniques and their inventors in 2014. Here's an example of some storm microscopy. This, first of all, is a conventional image. It's got two different colors because the way these imaging techniques work is you take some biological sample. In this case, the green parts here are microtubules and the pink parts here are mitochondria and you dye them. So you give them some fluorescent dye and then you hit these dyes with some light that excites them and then they, they fluoresce. In this case, they're fluorescing in two different colors, giving us the green and the pink. And so this would be conventional microscopy, and it's limited by diffraction. So we see some blurry bits there. If we turn on storm, then this is what we see. So vastly higher resolution. And you can see that what's happened here 
is that it's made up of lots and lots and lots of little points, and each of those points is a single molecule that's fluorescing, and the storm technique localizes the position of those individual points by measuring the center of their emission and then putting a dot on the map where the center of that molecule is. And so this is the, the bar here of three microns. The resolution in this case is around 20 to 30 nanometers, so well below the diffraction limit, about a factor of 10 below the diffraction limit, in fact. 